Just why it should have happened, or why it should have happened just when it did, he could not, of course, possibly have said, nor perhaps could it even have occurred to him to ask. The thing was, above all, a secret, something to be preciously concealed from mother and father, and to that very fact it owed an enormous part of its deliciousness. It was like a peculiarly beautiful trinket to be carried unmentioned in one's trouser pocket, a rare stamp, an old coin, a few tiny gold links found trodden out of shape on the path in the park, a pebble of carnelian, a seashell distinguishable from all others by an unusual spot or stripe, and, as if it were any one of these, he carried around with him everywhere a warm and persistent and increasingly beautiful sense of possession. Nor was it only a sense of possession, it was also a sense of protection. It was as if, in some delightful way, his secret gave him a fortress, a wall behind which he could retreat into heavenly seclusion. This was almost the first thing he had noticed about it, apart from the oddness of the thing itself. And it was this that now, again, for the fiftieth time, occurred to him as he sat in the little schoolroom. It was the half-hour for geography. Miss Robinson was revolving with one finger, slowly, a huge terrestrial globe which had been placed on her desk. The green and yellow continents passed and repassed, questions were asked and answered, and now the little girl in front of him, Astrid, who had a funny little constellation of freckles on the back of her neck, exactly like the Big Dipper, was standing up and telling Miss Robinson that the equator was the line that ran round the middle. Miss Robinson's face, which was old and greyish and kindly, with grey stiff curls beside the cheeks, and eyes that swam very brightly like minnows behind thick glasses, wrinkled itself into a complication of amusements. Ah, I see. The earth is wearing a belt, or a sash, or someone drew a line round it. Oh, no, not that. I mean... In the general laughter, he did not share, or only a very little... He was thinking about the Arctic and Antarctic regions, which, of course, on the globe, were white. Miss Robinson was now telling them about tropics, the jungles, the steamy heat or equatorial swamps, where the birds and butterflies and even the snakes were like living jewels. As he listened to these things, he was already, with a pleasant sense of half-effort, putting his secret between himself and the words. Was it really an effort at all? for effort implied something voluntary, and perhaps even something one did not especially want, whereas this was distinctly pleasant, and came almost of its own accord. All he needed to do was think of that morning, the first one, and then of all the others. But it was all so absurdly simple. It had amounted to all so little. It was nothing, just an idea, and just why it should have become so wonderful, so permanent, was a mystery. A very pleasant one, to be sure, but also, in an amusing way, foolish. However, without ceasing to listen to Miss Robinson, who had now moved up to the North Temperate Zone, he deliberated his memory of the first morning. It was only a moment or two after he had awakened, or perhaps the moment itself. But was there, to be exact... An exact moment. Was one awake all at once? Or was it gradual? Anyway, it was after he had stretched a lazy hand up towards the headrail and yawned, and then relaxed again among his worn covers, all the more grateful on a December morning, that the thing had happened. Suddenly, for no reason, he had thought of the postman. He remembered the postman. Perhaps there was nothing so odd in that. After all, he heard the postman almost every morning in his life. His heavy boots could be heard clumping round the corner at the top of the little cobbled hill street, and then progressively nearer, progressively louder, the double knock at each door, the crossings and recrossings of the street, till finally the clumsy steps came stumbling across to the very door, and the tremendous knock came which shook the house itself. Miss Robinson was saying, Vast wheat-growing areas in North America and Siberia. 
Astrid had for the moment placed her left hand across the back of her neck. But on this particular morning, the first morning, as he lay there with his eyes closed, he had for some reason waited for the postman. He wanted to hear him come round the corner. And that was precisely the joke. He never did. He never came. He never had come round the corner again. For when at last the steps were heard, they had already, he was quite sure, come a little down the hill to the first house. And even so, the steps were curiously different. They were softer. They had a new secrecy about them. They were muffled and indistinct. And while the rhythm of them was the same, it now said a new thing. It said peace. It said remoteness. It said cold. It said sleep. And he had understood the situation at once. Nothing could have seemed simpler. There had been snow in the night, such as all winter he had been longing for, and it was this which had rendered the postman's first footsteps inaudible, and the later ones faint. Of course! How lovely! And even now it must be snowing. It was going to be a snowy day. The long white ragged lines were drifting and sifting across the street, across the faces of the old houses, whispering and hushing, making little triangles of white in the corners between cobblestones, seething a little when the wind blew them over the ground to a drifted corner. And so it would be all day, getting deeper and deeper and growing more and more silent. Miss Robinson was saying, Land of perpetual snow. All this time, of course, while he lay in bed, he had kept his eyes closed, listening to the nearer progress of the postman, the muffled footsteps thumping and slipping on the snow-sheathed cobbles, and all the other sounds, the double knocks, a frosty far-off voice or two, a bell ringing thinly and softly as if under a sheet of ice, had the same slightly abstracted quality, as if removed by one degree from actuality as if everything in the world had been insulated by snow. But when at last, pleased, he opened his eyes, and turned them towards the window, to see for himself this long-desired and now so clearly imagined miracle, what he saw instead was brilliant sunlight on a roof, and when, astonished, he jumped out of bed and stared down into the street, expecting to see the cobbles obliterated by snow, he saw nothing but the bare, bright cobbles themselves. Queer the effect this extraordinary surprise had had upon him. All the following morning he had kept with him a sense as of snow falling about him, a secret screen of new snow between himself and the world. If he had not dreamed such a thing, and how could he have dreamed it while awake, how else could one explain it? In any case... The delusion had been so vivid as to affect his entire behaviour. He could not now remember whether it was on the first or the second morning, or was it even the third, that his mother had drawn attention to some oddness in his manner. "'But, my darling,' she had said at the breakfast-table, "'what has come over you? You don't seem to be listening.' And how often that very thing had happened since! Miss Robinson was now asking if anyone knew the difference between the North Pole and the Magnetic Pole. Astrid was holding up her flickering, freckled hand, and he could see the four white dimples that marked the knuckles. Perhaps it hadn't been either the second or third morning, or even the fourth or fifth. How could he be sure? How could he be sure just when the delicious progress had become clear? Just when had it really begun? The intervals weren't very precise. All he now knew was that at some point or other, perhaps the second day, perhaps the sixth, he had noticed that the presence of the snow was a little more insistent, the sound of it clearer, and conversely the sound of the postman's footsteps more indistinct. Not only could he not hear the steps come round the corner, he could not even hear them at the first house. It was below the second house that he heard them, and a few days later, below the third. Gradually, gradually, the snow was becoming heavier, the sound of it seething louder, 
the cobblestones more and more muffled. When he found each morning, on going to the window, after the ritual of listening, that the roofs and cobbles were bare as ever, it made no difference. This was, after all, only what he had expected. It was even what pleased him, what rewarded him. The thing was his own, belonged to no one else. No one else knew about it, not even his mother and father. There, outside, were the bare cobbles, and here, inside, was the snow. Snow growing heavier each day, muffling the world, hiding the ugly, and deadening increasingly, above all, the steps of the postman. "'But, my darling,' she had said at the luncheon table, "'what has come over you? You don't seem to listen when people speak to you. That's the third time I've asked you to pass your plate.' How was one to explain this to mother, or to father? There was, of course, nothing to be done about it. Nothing. All one could do was to laugh embarrassedly, pretend to be a little ashamed, apologise, and take a sudden and somewhat disingenuous interest in what was being done or said. The cat had stayed out all night. He had a curious swelling on his left cheek. Perhaps somebody had kicked him, or a stone had struck him. Mrs. Kensington was, or was not, coming to tea. The house was going to be cleaned or turned out on Wednesday instead of Friday. A new lamp was provided for his evening work. Perhaps it was eye-strain which accounted for this new and so peculiar vagueness of his. Mother was looking at him with amusement as she said this, but with something else as well. A new lamp? A new lamp. No, mother. Yes, mother, school is going very well. The geometry is very easy. The history is very dull. The geography is very interesting, particularly when it takes one to the North Pole. Why the North Pole? Oh, well, it would be fun to be an explorer. Another Peary or Scott or Shackleton. And then, abruptly, he found his interest in the talk at an end, stared at the pudding on his plate, listened, waited, and began once more. Ah, how heavenly, too, the first beginnings to hear or feel, for could he actually hear it? The silent snow. Miss Robinson was telling them about the search for the Northwest Passage, about Hendrick Hudson. This had been, indeed, the only distressing feature of the new experience. The fact that it so increasingly had brought him into a kind of mute misunderstanding, or even conflict, with his father and mother. It was as if he were trying to lead a double life. On the one hand, he had to be David Jones, and keep up the appearance of being that person, dress, wash, and answer intelligently when spoken to. On the other hand, he had to explore this new world which had been opened to him. Nor could there be the slightest doubt, not the slightest, that the new world was the profounder and more wonderful of the two. It was irresistible. It was miraculous. Its beauty was simply beyond anything, beyond speech as beyond thought, utterly incommunicable. But how then, between the two worlds, of which he was thus constantly aware, was he to keep a balance? One must get up, one must go to breakfast, one must talk with mother, go to school, do one's lessons, and, in all this, try not to appear too much a fool. But, if all the while one was also trying to extract the full deliciousness of another and quite separate existence, one which could not easily, if at all, be spoken of, how was one to manage? How was one to explain? Would it be safe to explain? Would it be absurd? Would it merely mean that he would get into some obscure kind of trouble? These thoughts came and went, came and went, as softly and secretly as the snow. They were not precisely a disturbance. Perhaps they were even a pleasure. He liked to have them. Their presence was something almost palpable, something he could stroke with his hand. Without closing his eyes, and without ceasing to see Miss Robinson and the schoolroom and the globe and the freckles on Astrid's neck. 
Nevertheless, he did in a sense cease to see, or to see the obvious external world, and substituted for this vision the vision of snow, the sound of snow, and the slow, almost soundless approach of the postman. Yesterday it had been only at the sixth house that the postman had become audible. The snow was much deeper now. It was falling more swiftly and heavily. The sound of its seething was more distinct, more soothing, more persistent. And this morning it had been, as nearly as he could figure, just above the seventh house, perhaps only a step or two above. At most he had heard two or three footsteps before the knock had sounded, and with each narrowing of the sphere, each nearer approach of the limit at which the postman was first audible, it was odd how sharply was increased the amount of illusion which had to be carried into the ordinary business of daily life. Each day it was harder to get out of bed, to go to the window, to look out at the, as always, perfectly empty and snowless street. Each day it was more difficult to go through the perfunctory motions of greeting mother and father at breakfast, to reply to their questions, to put his books together and go to school. And at school, how extraordinarily hard to conduct with success simultaneously the public life and the life that was secret. There were times when he longed, positively ached, to tell everyone about it, to burst out with it, only to be checked almost at once by a far-off feeling as of some faint absurdity which was inherent in it. But was it absurd, and more importantly, by a sense of mysterious power in his very secrecy? Yes, it must be kept secret. That more and more became clear, at whatever cost to himself, whatever pain to others. Miss Robinson looked straight at him, smiling, and said, Perhaps we'll ask David. I'm sure David will come out of his daydream long enough to be able to tell us, won't you, David? He rose slowly from his chair, resting one hand on the brightly varnished desk, and deliberately stared to the snow towards the blackboard. It was an effort, but it was amusing to make it. Yes, he said slowly. It was what we now call the Hudson River. This he thought to be the Northwest Passage. He was disappointed. He sat down again, and as he did so, Astrid half turned in her chair and gave him a shy smile of approval and admiration. At whatever pain to others. This part of it was very puzzling. Very puzzling. Mother was very nice, and so was father. Yes, that was all true enough. He wanted to be nice to them, to tell them everything. And yet, was it really wrong of him to want to have a secret place of his own? At bedtime, the night before, Mother had said, If this goes on, my lad, we'll have to see a doctor. We will. We can't have our boy. But what was it she had said? Living in another world? Live so far away? The word far had been in it, he was sure. And then Mother had taken up a magazine again and laughed a little, but with an expression which wasn't mirthful. He had felt sorry for her. The bell rang for dismissal. The sound came to him through long curved parallels of falling snow. He saw Astrid rise, and had himself risen almost as soon, but not quite as soon as she. On the walk homeward, which was timeless, it pleased him to see through the accompaniment, or counterpoint, of the snow, the items of mere externality on his way. There were many kinds of bricks in the sidewalks, and laid in many kinds of pattern. The garden walls were too various, some of wood palings, some of plaster, some of stone. Twigs of bushes leaned over the walls, the little hard green winter buds of lilac on grey stems, sheathed and fat, other branches very thin and fine, and black and desiccated. Dirty sparrows huddled in bushes, as dull in colour as dead fruit left in the leafless trees. A single starling creaked on a weather vane. In the gutter, beside a drain, was a scrap of torn and dirty newspaper, caught in a little delta of filth. The word heartburn appeared in large capitals, 
and below it was a letter from Mrs. Angela M. Barnett, 2001 Cypress Hill, Beckenham, London, to the effect that after being a sufferer for years she had been cured by Carter's pills. In the little delta, beside the fan-shaped and deeply runnelled continent of brown mud, were lost twigs, descended from their parent trees, dead matches, a rusty horse-chestnut burr, a small concentration of sparkling gravel on the lip of the sewer, a fragment of eggshell, a streak of yellow sawdust which had been wet and was now dry and congealed, a brown pebble and a broken feather. Further on was a cement sidewalk, ruled into geometrical parallelograms, with a brass inlay at one end commemorating the contractors who had laid it, and halfway across, an irregular and random series of dog tracks, immortalised in synthetic stone. He knew these well, and always stepped on them, to cover the little hollows with his own foot, and always stepped on them. To cover the little hollows with his own foot had always been a queer pleasure. Today he did it once more, but perfunctorily and detached, all the while thinking of something else. That was a dog, a long time ago, who had made a mistake and walked on the cement while it was still wet. He had probably wagged his tail, but that hadn't been recorded. Now David Jones, aged twelve, on his way home from school, crossed the same river, which in the meantime had frozen solid, homeward through the snow, the snow falling in bright sunshine. Homeward? Then came the gateway with the two posts surmounted by egg-shaped stones which had been cunningly balanced on their ends, and mortared in the very act of balance, a source of perpetual wonder. On the brick wall, just beyond, the letter H had been stenciled, presumably for some purpose. H. H. The red hydrant, with a little green painted chain attached to the brass screw cap. The willow tree with a great grey wound in the bark, kidney-shaped, into which he always put his hand to feel the cold but living wood. The injury, he had been sure, was due to the gnawings of a tethered horse. But now it deserved only a passing palm, a merely tolerant eye. There were more important things. Miracles. Beyond the thoughts of trees, mere willows. Beyond the thoughts of sidewalks, mere stone, mere brick, mere cement. Beyond the thoughts even of his own shoes, which trod these sidewalks obediently, bearing a burden, far above, of elaborate mystery. He watched them. They were not polished. He had neglected them for a very good reason. They were one of the many parts of the increasing difficulty of the daily return to daily life the morning struggle, to get up, having at last opened one's eyes, to go to the window and discover, no snow, to wash, to dress, to descend the curving stairs to breakfast. At whatever pain to others, nevertheless, one must persevere in severance, since the incommunicability of the experience demanded it. It was desirable, of course, to be kind to mother and father, especially as they seemed to be worried, but it was also desirable to be resolute. If they should decide, as appeared likely to consult the doctor, Dr. Roberts, and have David inspected, his heart listened to through a kind of dictaphone, his lungs, his stomach, well, that was all right. He would go through with it. He would give them answer for question, too. Perhaps such answers as they hadn't expected, no, that would never do, for the secret world must, at all costs, be preserved. The birdhouse in the apple tree was empty. It was the wrong time of year for wrens. The little round black door had lost its pleasure. The wrens were enjoying other houses, other nests, remoter trees. But this, too, was a notion which he only vaguely and grazingly entertained, as if... For the moment he merely touched an edge of it. There was something further on, which was already assuming a sharper importance, 
something which already teased at the corners of his eyes, teasing also at the corner of his mind. It was funny to think that he so wanted this, so awaited it, and yet found himself enjoying this momentary dalliance with the birdhouse, as if for a quite deliberate postponement and enhancement of the approaching pleasure. He was aware of his delay, of his smiling and detached, and now almost uncomprehending gaze at the little birdhouse. He knew what he was going to look at next. It was his own little cobbled hill street, his own house, the little river at the bottom of the hill, the grocer's shop with the cardboard man in the window. And now, thinking of all this, he turned his head, still smiling, and looking quickly right and left, through the snow-laden sunlight. And the mist of snow as he had foreseen was still on it, a ghost of snow falling in the bright sunlight, softly and steadily floating and turning and pausing, soundlessly meeting the snow that covered, as with a transparent mirage, the bare, bright cobbles. He loved it. He stood still and loved it. Its beauty was paralyzing, beyond all words, all experience, all dream. No fairy story he had ever read could be compared with it. None had ever given him this extraordinary combination of ethereal loveliness with something else, unnameable, which was just faintly and deliciously terrifying. What was this thing? As he thought of it, he looked upward towards his own bedroom window, which was open, and it was as if he looked straight into the room and saw himself lying half awake in his bed. There he was. At this very instant he was still, perhaps actually, more truly there than standing here at the edge of the cobbled hill street, with one hand lifted to shade his eyes against the snow sun. Had he indeed ever left his room, in all this time, since that very first morning? Was the whole progress still being enacted there? Was it still the same morning, and himself not yet wholly awake? And even now, had the postman not yet come round the corner? The idea amused him, and automatically, as he thought of it, he turned his head and looked toward the top of the hill. There was, of course, nothing there. Nothing, and no one. The street was empty and quiet, and all the more because of its emptiness it occurred to him to count the houses, a thing which, oddly enough, he hadn't before thought of doing. Of course, he had known there weren't many, many, that is, on his own side of the street, which were the ones that figured in the postman's progress. But nevertheless it came to him as something of a shock to find that there were precisely six above his own house. His own house was the seventh. Six! Astonished, he looked at his own house, looked at the door, on which was the number thirteen, and then realized that the whole thing was exactly and logically and absurdly what he ought to have known. Just the same the realization gave him abruptly, and even a little frighteningly, a sense of hurry. He was being hurried. He was being rushed. For, he knit his brows, he couldn't be mistaken. It was just above the seventh house, his own house, that the postman had first been audible this very morning. But in that case, in that case, did it mean that tomorrow he would hear nothing? The knock he had heard must have been the knock of their own door. Did it mean, and this was an idea which gave him a really extraordinary feeling of surprise, that he would never hear the postman again? that tomorrow morning the postman would have passed the house, in a snow by then so deep as to render his footsteps completely inaudible, that he would have made his approach down the snow-filled street so soundlessly, so secretly, that he, David Jones, there lying in bed, would not have awakened in time, or waking, would have heard nothing. But how could that be? Unless even the knocker should be muffled in the snow, frozen tight, perhaps, but, in that case, a vague feeling of disappointment came over him, a vague sadness, as if he felt himself deprived of something which he had long looked forward to, something 
much prized. After all this, all this beautiful progress, the slow, delicious advance of the postman through the silent and secret snow, the knock creeping closer each day, and the footsteps nearer, the audible compass of the world thus daily narrowed, 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 as the snow soothingly and beautifully encroached and deepened. After all this, was he to be defrauded of the one thing he had so wanted, to be able to count, as it were, the last two or three solemn footsteps, as they finally approached his own door. Was it all going to happen at the end, so suddenly, or indeed had it already happened, with no slow and subtle gradations of menace in which he could luxuriate? He gazed upward again toward his own window which flashed in the sun, and this time almost with a feeling that it would be better if he were still in bed, in that room, for in that case this must still be the first morning, and there would be six more mornings to come, or, for that matter, seven or eight or nine. How could he be sure? Or even more? After supper, the Inquisition began. He stood before the doctor, under the lamp, and submitted silently to the usual thumpings and tappings. Now, will you please say, ah? Ah! Now, again, please, if you don't mind. Ah! Say it slowly, and hold it if you can. Ah! Good. How silly all this was, as if it had anything to do with his throat, or his heart, or lungs. Relaxing his mouth, of which the corners, after all this absurd stretching, felt uncomfortable, he avoided the doctor's eyes, and stared towards the fireplace, past his mother's feet, in grey slippers, which projected from the green chair, and his father's feet, in brown slippers, which stood neatly side by side on the hearthrug. Hmm, there's certainly nothing wrong there. He felt the doctor's eyes fixed upon him, and, as if merely to be polite, returned the look, but with a feeling of justifiable evasiveness. Now, young man, tell me, do you feel all right? Yes, sir, quite all right. No headaches? No dizziness? No, I don't think so. Let me see. Let's get a book, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you, that will do splendidly. And now, David, if you'll just read it, holding it as you would normally hold it. He took the book and read. Now I plunge my pen against the page and scribble toward a purpose unperceived. For here, within my fragile fractured frame, I am no more a poet than a rose, and though the visions I do view bid beauty to my meaning, my muse is buried elsewhere, nursing other selves. Therefore, unfailingly, I fall into shadow, baptized by merciless melancholy, enabled to imbue with silhouette of life a bit of martyred matter, from so faint a slate as this. I would label it as mine, ostensibly, mine to brag of, mine to burn, but when I feature feelings from the fire, they float away from me, like writing on the water. He stopped, tentatively, and lowered the heavy book. No, as I thought, there is certainly no superficial sign of eye strain. Silence thronged the room, and he was aware of the focused scrutiny of the three people who confronted him. We could have his eyes examined, but I believe it is something else. What could it be? This was his father's voice. It is only this curious, absent-minded. This was his mother's voice. In the presence of the doctor, they both seemed irritatingly apologetic. I believe it is something else. Now, David, I would like very much to ask you a question or two. You will answer them, won't you? You know I am an old friend of yours, eh? That's right. His back was thumped twice by the doctor's fat fist. Then the doctor was grinning at him with false amiability, while with one fingernail he was scratching the top button of his waistcoat. Beyond the doctor's shoulders was the fire, the fingers of flame making light prestidigitation against the sooty fireback, the soft sound of their random flutter the only sound. I would like to know, is there anything that worries you? 
the doctor was again smiling his eyelids low against the little black pupils, in each of which was a tiny white bead of light. Why answer him? Why answer him at all? At whatever pain to others. But it was all a nuisance, this necessity for resistance, this necessity for attention. It was as if one had been stood up on a brilliantly lighted stage, under a great round blaze of spotlight, as if one were merely a trained seal or a performing dog, or a fish, dipped out of an aquarium and held up by the tail. It would serve them right if he were merely to bark or growl, and meanwhile to miss these last few precious hours, these hours of which every minute was more beautiful than the last, more menacing. He still looked, as if from a great distance, at the beads of light in the doctor's eyes, at the fixed false smile, and then beyond once more at his mother's slippers, his father's slippers, the soft flutter of the fire. Even here, even amongst these hostile presences, and in this arranged light, he could see the snow, he could hear it. It was in the corners of the room where the shadow was deepest, under the sofa, behind the half-opened door which led to the dining-room. It was gentler here, softer, it seethed the quietest of whispers, as if, in deference to the drawing-room, it had quite deliberately put on its manners. It kept itself out of sight, obliterated itself, but distinctly with an air of saying, Ah, but just wait, wait till we are alone together. Then I will begin to tell you something new, something white, something cold, something sleepy, something of cease and peace, and the long, bright curve of space. Tell them to go away, banish them, refuse to speak, leave them, go upstairs to your room, turn out the light and get into bed. I will go with you. I will be waiting for you. I will tell you a better story than the monkey's paw or la grande bretèche. I will surround your bed. I will close the windows, pile a deep drift against the door, so that none will ever again be able to enter. Speak to them. It seemed as if the little hissing voice came from a slow white spiral of falling flakes in the corner by the front window. But he could not be sure. He felt himself smiling then, and said to the doctor, but without looking at him, looking beyond him still. Oh, no, I think not. But are you sure, my boy? His father's voice came softly and coldly then, the familiar voice of silken warning. You needn't answer at once, David. Remember, we're trying to help you. Think it over and be quite sure, won't you? He felt himself smiling again at the notion of being quite sure. What a joke! as if he weren't so sure that reassurance was no longer necessary, and all this cross-examination a ridiculous farce, a grotesque parody. What could they know about it? Why, even now, even now, with the proof so abundant, so formidable, so imminent, so appallingly present here in this very room, could they believe it? Could even his mother believe it? No. It was only too plain that if anything was said about it, the merest hint given— they would be incredulous, they would laugh, they would say, absurd, think things about him which weren't true. Why, no, I'm not worried. Why should I be? He looked then at the doctor's low-lidded eyes, looked from one of them to the other, from one bead of light to the other, and gave a little laugh. The doctor seemed to be disconcerted by this, he drew back in his chair, resting a fat white hand on either knee. The smile faded slowly from his face. "'Well, David,' he said, and paused gravely, "'I'm afraid you don't take this quite seriously enough. I think you perhaps don't quite realise. Don't quite realise. He took a deep breath and turned as if helpless, at a loss for words, to the others. But mother and father were both silent.' No help was forthcoming. You must surely know, B, 
be aware that you have not been quite yourself of late. Don't you know that? It was amusing to watch the doctor's renewed attempt at a smile, a queer, disorganized look, as of confidential embarrassment. I feel all right, sir, he said, and again gave a little laugh. And we're trying to help you. The doctor's tone sharpened. Yes, sir, I know, but why? I'm all right. I'm just thinking, that's all. His mother made a quick movement forward, resting a hand on the back of the doctor's chair. Thinking, she said. But my dear, about what? This was a direct challenge and would have to be directly met. But before he met it, he looked again into the corner by the door, as if for reassurance. He smiled again at what he saw, at what he heard. The little spiral was still there, still softly whirling like the ghost of a white kitten chasing the ghost of a white tail, and making, as it did so, the faintest of whispers. It was all right. If only he could remain firm, everything was going to be all right. Oh, about anything, about nothing, you know, the way you do. You mean daydreaming? Oh, no, thinking. But... Thinking about what? Anything. He laughed a third time, but this time, happening to glance upward towards his mother's face, he was appalled at the effect his laughter seemed to have upon her. Her mouth had opened in an expression of horror. This was too bad. Unfortunate. He had known it would cause pain, of course, but he hadn't expected it to be quite so bad as this. Perhaps, perhaps if he gave them a tiny, gleaming hint. About the snow, he said. What on earth? This was his father's voice. The brown slippers came a step nearer on the hearth rug. But my dear, what do you mean? This was his mother's voice. The doctor merely stared. Just snow, that's all. I like to think about it. Tell us about it, my boy. But that's all it is. There's nothing to tell. You know what snow is. This he said almost angrily, for he felt they were trying to corner him. He turned sideways so as no longer to face the doctor, and better to see the inch of blackness between the window sill and the lowered curtains. The cold inch of beckoning and delicious night. At once he felt better, more assured. Mother, can I go to bed now, please? I've got a headache. But I thought you said... It's just come. It's all these questions. Can I, Mother? You can go as soon as the doctor has finished. Don't you think this thing ought to be gone into thoroughly? And now... This was his father's voice. The brown slippers again came a step nearer. The voice was the well-known punishment voice. Resonant and cruel. Oh, what's the use, Stephen? Quite suddenly, everyone was silent, and without precisely facing them, nevertheless he was aware that all three of them were watching him with extraordinary intensity, staring hard at him, as if he had done something monstrous, or was himself some kind of monster. He could hear the soft, irregular flutter of the flames, the tick-tock, tick-tock, tick of the clock, far and faint, Two sudden spurts of laughter from the kitchen, as quickly cut off as begun, a murmur of water in the pipes. And then the silence seemed to deepen, to spread out, to become world-long and world-wide, to become timeless and shapeless, and to the centre inevitably and rightly, with a slow and sleepy but enormous concentration of all power on the beginning of a new sound. What this new sound was going to be, he knew perfectly well. It might begin with a hiss, but it would end with a roar. There was no time to lose. He must escape. It mustn't happen here. Without another word, he turned and ran up the stairs. Not a moment too soon. The darkness was coming in long, white waves, 
A prolonged sibilance filled the night. A great seamless seethe of wild influence went abruptly across it. A cold, low humming shook the windows. He shut the door and flung off his clothes in the dark. The bare black floor was like a little raft tossed in waves of snow, almost overwhelmed, washed under whitely, up again, smothered in curled billows of white. The snow was laughing. It spoke from all sides at once. It pressed closer to him as he ran and jumped, exulting, into his bed. "'Listen to us,' it said. "'Listen. We have come to tell you the story we told you about. You remember.' Lie down. Shut your eyes now. You will no longer see much. In this white darkness, who could see or want to see? We will take the place of everything. Listen. A beautiful varying dance of snow began at the front of the room, came forward and then retreated, flattened out toward the door, then rose fountain-like to the ceiling, swayed, recruited itself from a new stream of flakes which poured laughing in through the humming window, advanced again, lifted long white arms. It said peace. It said remoteness. It said cold. It said... But then a gash of horrible light fell brutally across the room from the opening door. The snow drew back, hissing. Something alien had come into the room, something hostile. This thing rushed at him, clutched at him, shook him. And he was not merely horrified, he was filled with such a loathing as he had never known. What was this? This cruel disturbance, this act of anger and hate? It was as if he had to reach up a hand toward another world for any understanding of it, an effort of which he was only barely capable. But of that other world, he still remembered just enough to know the exorcising words. They tore themselves from his other life, suddenly. Mother! Mother! Go away! I hate you! And with that effort, everything was solved. Everything became all right. The seamless hiss advanced once more. The long, white, wavering lines rose and fell like enormous, whispering sea waves. The whisper becoming louder. The laughter more intensely maniacal. Listen, it said. We'll tell you the last, the most beautiful and secret story. Shut your eyes. It is a very small story. A story that gets smaller and smaller. It comes inward instead of opening like a flower. It is a flower becoming a seed, a little cold seed. Do you hear? We are leaning closer to you. The hiss was now becoming a roar. The whole world was a vast moving screen of snow. But even now it said peace. It said remoteness. It said cold. It said sleep. <laughs>